Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, again for another uh, another ed edition of our Safer at Home series. And uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. It's a, a, a sultry night here in Plymouth. I assume it's that way in, in Falmouth. It was a sultry day, I know. Um, uh, before we get started, a couple things I want to point out. Um, uh, uh, these lectures are brought to you uh, with the sponsorship of Cape Cod 5, Martha's Vineyard Savings, and First Citizens Federal Credit Union. We also have a special sponsor for, we've got certain certain programs that, that we are doing, um, because if you recall, this is the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote. So um, Mass Humanities has put together uh, a program of which we are taking part, it's called The Vote, and we have certain um, programs coming up of which this is one. Uh, we've got a, a program coming up on Tuesday at two o'clock um, uh, in which it's a reenactment of a, a, a woman named Cheryl uh, uh, Fay is going uh, as uh, Susan B. Anthony and we've got a couple of other programs coming up as well. If you also go to our website uh, my sincere thanks to Michelle Coughlin who has been putting together um, a, a series of women's suffrage moments in a timeline, as well as a reading list for you to check out. And Michelle is actually going to be doing a presentation in November, on November 12th. Uh, so my, my sincere thanks to Michelle. Um, so I want you to be aware of some of the programs we've got coming up uh, regarding the women's uh, suffrage movement. We are being recorded. Uh, I think most of you that you have, most of you that have joined me know that we're being recorded. If you've got a question, uh, be sure to use the chat feature down below, and um, um, and it gives me great pleasure to have as our guest uh, from the University of Virginia, Corinne Field, as you can see there, by uh, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Department at the Univers University of Virginia, as well as the fact she's also got some uh, uh, credentials in the um, in the Gender History Department as well. So. I mean, in the um, or, um, in black history as well. So not just gender history. So yes, I'm sure uh, Dr. Field, there's probably gonna be a question about Kamala Harris at the end of this, but uh, uh, we'll defer to that. But um, <laughs> would, you, uh, would you welcome Dr. Corinne Field? Mark, thank you so much for this invitation. And I, I want to Thank all of you that are on this call. I'm just delighted to talk with you. I did have a chance to look around the website of the Falmouth Historical Society, and Michelle, you've done a great job with those resources. It's really excellent. So I hope you all have a chance to check out the suffrage resources that they have up, which will give um, a very broad view of the movement. And what I want to focus your attention on um, tonight, and I will definitely take questions about the current political moment at the end and would love to hear your thoughts. I really want to draw your attention to the way age has shaped women's participation in politics. And I want to look specifically at old women and political power. So not just the right to vote, but also the right to be voted for. And the work that older women in the suffrage movement, both black and white, did to try to convince women um, that they should want to be leaders as they grew older, and then to convince American voters that mature women could be experienced and competent leaders um, who belonged in political power. So as we commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment on August 18th, um, sorry, there's going to be some technical glitches here. Uh, so August 18th, Tuesday, which removes sex as a barrier to voting, I want to talk about an issue that was not in that abstract language of the 19th Amendment. And my argument tonight is that 19th century women suffragists devoted a remarkable amount of time and attention to old women and old age as political issues. So from the 1830s, when the anti-slavery movement first began to claim a public voice for women in American politics through the final push for women's suffrage in the 1910s, influential leaders argued that women would never achieve political power in democratic governments unless ordinary citizens stopped denigrating and patronizing older women and instead recognized gray hair and wrinkles as signs of competence, authority, and charisma. I would just 
say we still have a long way to go on that. <laughs> um, so to convince Americans that older women belonged in positions of political power, suffragists pushed older women to the forefront of their organizations. They created and circulated positive images of their very oldest leaders, such as this wonderful studio portrait that was taken in 1906 of three veteran activists, including Susan B. Anthony there on, on your right. And then these, these leaders also theorized the ways in which white men retain political power in part by sexualizing young girls and then ridiculing old women. So today, Susan B. Anthony is the best known woman suffragist. She rose to national prominence after the Civil War when she was already in her 50s, and she achieved her greatest influence when she was in her 70s. But she was not alone. The most famous suffrage leaders from the 19th century were all middle-aged or older. And this is as true on the local level in Massachusetts as it is on the national level. So Massachusetts suffrage leaders were also generally middle-aged or older when they gained national influence. They often began their activism at a younger age, but really became well-known in later life. Now, younger women were also active in the movement, building organizations, collaborating closely with elders. But the women that this movement elevated in the 19th century were old. And I want to argue that activists elevated these women for a reason. So they wanted not just to vote, but also to be voted for. They wanted to put women in state houses, in Congress, in governorships, in the White House. And they saw that the higher the office, the more likely its occupant to be old. So the Constitution specifies that the President of the United States must be at least 35 years old. In practice, Americans tend to elect men much older than that, usually in their 50s or 60s. In 1900, when Susan B. Anthony was at the height of her fame, a man under 45 had never been elected president. Americans worshiped white-haired George Washington as the father of the country, celebrating his birthday every year in February. Anthony also had a February birthday. And starting in 1870, when she turned 50 years old, suffragists turned her birth date into an annual event. By 1900, women suffragists throughout the nation gathered to celebrate her birthday, hailing her as the George Washington of the suffrage movement and a grand old woman. The promotion of Anthony was not just an effort to convince Americans that they should vote, that women should be able to vote for president, but at a time when most women could not vote for president, they wanted to argue that a woman should actually be president and that Anthony was someone who was qualified for that office. So tonight I want to argue that this campaign to empower older women failed for three significant reasons. First, the tenacity of fear, ridicule, and disgust for older women in our culture, mobilized largely by men in positions of cultural and political power, but not exclusively. Because second, we need to look at the significance of women's own fears about growing older and young women's desires to liberate themselves from their elders. And third, we need to take note of the tendency of property educated, mostly white women, to focus on their own empowerment in later life, while often extracting labor and depending upon women that they enslaved or employed as domestic servants in their homes. And that refusal to imagine what an empowered old age would look like across class and racial barriers was one reason that I think this movement failed. So these divisions of gender, age, and race worked in ways that continued to undermine the authority of older women, rendering them ridiculous and suggesting that they had no place in politics. So first, let me say something by what I mean by old. So according to women's rights activists, the category old functioned not as a measure of chronological age per se, but as a means of ridiculing and reproaching women whom people found unattractive. So at the first National Women's Rights Convention held in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850, Lucretia Mott said that, quote, a woman has nothing but her outward semblance in her favor. When that ceases, all respect for her vanishes, for an old woman is simply an object of ridicule. 
and anything that is ridiculous or foolish is said to be only fit for an old woman. 20 years later in 1870, Matilda Jocelyn Gage said that a woman is held by the world as a toy and a slave. A woman's value, like such articles, has only been in her youth and good looks. Loved and prized for her body alone, her intellect and her soul have been passed aside as dross, and no terms of reproach have equaled those of old woman, old maid. Now, when you think about this linking of old women and old maid, those aren't terms that are usually thought of together. And what I want you to understand is that in the 19th century, um, ordinary Americans in their diaries and letters, as well as cultural authorities in prescriptive literature and in novels, all agreed that a woman became an old maid at 30. So think about that for a second. If you're an old maid at 30 and you can't be president until 35, you can see how this function of old as a category of ridicule work to, to read women out of politics. So I think when you hear me talk about old, I want you to remember that it's talking about old as a kind of stigma, not as passage by a certain birthday. So um, what these women argued was that oldness, the cultural meanings of oldness needed to change. And I want to focus um, on some of the strategies they used to do that and start first with the theoretical insights and political uh, strategies developed by Black women such as Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. And I want you to notice how Gage references slavery in this quote, so a woman has been a toy and a slave, but without talking about the specific struggles of Black women trying to build lives after emancipation. And this move is quite typical of the failures of educated, propertied white women who treated slavery as a metaphor for their own experience rather than a lived reality for many women. And I think we should recognize this as a form of racism. There's really nothing else to call it. But if we simply focus on Gage's racism, and I think the racism of white women's rights activists has sort of become old news at this point. Many people are aware of that. If we focus just on the racism, we lose sight of the ways in which she actually learned about age dynamics of slavery from Black women themselves. So Black women were among the first in America to define age as a political issue that was central to women's liberation, and white activists learned from, from their arguments. So at the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Mott closed that event by, by celebrating the words of Sojourner Truth, a self-liberated former slave born in upstate New York. Truth had delivered a long speech defining anti-slavery and women's rights as part of God's unfolding plan for human progress. Truth was also selling the recently published narrative of her life. And you can see the, the title page here. One of Truth's main points in this book was that enslavers exploited the productive and reproductive potential of young people, particularly women, wearing out their bodies prematurely, and then once they could no longer work, left them to die of neglect. So Truth's first enslaver, an old white man, provided for his white children's future by rendering Truth's family heritable property, selling her away from her parents, destroying her parents' ability to raise her and her own ability to care for them as they aged. So slavery in Truth's analysis was a system that rendered older Black people disposable, even as it made wealth for white families. As Truth lectured at women's rights and anti-slavery conventions, she insisted that white Northerners owed material support to people like herself who had spent their, year, their youth in slavery, their productive and reproductive capacity benefiting enslavers without any ability to provide for their own security in later life. In 1870, in the midst of Reconstruction, Truth began circulating a petition that read, to the Senate and House of Representatives in Congress assembled, we the undersigned therefore earnestly request your honorable body to set apart for freed people a portion of public land in the West and erect buildings thereon for the aged and infirm, 
and otherwise legislate so as to secure the desired result. So Truth argued that the federal government owed enslaved people support, not out of charity, but because of a debt that had yet to be paid. So as she explained in an updated 1870 edition of her narrative, we, meaning enslaved people, have been a source of wealth to this republic, earning millions of money. Our unpaid labor has been a stepping stone to its financial success. Some of its dividends must surely be ours. And she thought the most compelling case for payment of these dividends was to elderly people who were emancipated at the time that their youthful strength and productive capacities had already declined. So you can see in this petition, which she ended up circulating for the next 20 years, the way she's linking racial justice to old age security. So she sees that freedom is not enough unless freedom also comes with material support for older people. And I think it's a very expansive definition of what the politics of old age would be for women. Now, Harriet Tubman also regarded material support in old age as essential to the rights and freedoms of black women. So some of you may have seen the movie Harriet last year. And if you haven't, I suggest you rent it and watch it. I think it's quite wonderful. But it ends after the Civil War when Tubman reunites with her parents in Auburn, New York. And their brief titles that mention she went on to advocate for freed people, women's rights, and old people. But the movie's kind of over. In fact, she remained active into the 20th century. She lives an incredibly long life. And in um, Tubman founded a home for aged freed people on her property in Auburn, New York. And she spent much of her later life fundraising for this institution. Her efforts to provide for her own parents led her to make a broader argument that young people, black and white, owed aging freed people material support. So she, like Truth, saw women's right to vote as a means for securing economic justice, not a means in itself. Now, Lucretia Mott also um, continued to work with both Truth and Tubman after the Civil War. Um, Mott's sister lived near Tub Tubman in Auburn, and Truth and Mott frequently crossed paths on the lecture circuit. Mott agreed with Truth and Tubman that white families, even if they had not directly owned slaves, owed financial support to formerly enslaved people. So she supported the Philadelphia Home for Aged and Infirmed Colored People after the Civil War, and she urged white people, especially white abolitionists who were turning their attention to other issues, that they should donate to this institution as, quote, but a small return for the wrongs done to the colored people, end quote. So both Mott and Truth remained politically active into their 80s. As they grew older, Mont and Truth posed for numerous photographs that they distributed and sold to supporters. They both adopted this simple style of Quaker dress and struck poses that radiated competence and wisdom. I think we need to read these images as an effort to show Americans what older women leaders could look like. And I argue that we need to recognize that this strategy uh, was an effort that cut across the color line that actually brought black and white women together at certain points. Now, many white suffragists did turn their backs on black women after the Civil War. Of these, Elizabeth Cady Stanton has probably become the most notorious. But even as Stanton focused on the needs of educated white women like herself, she took up the argument that white men exploited young girls and then discarded older women. This was a logic also articulated by black women, though Stanton downplayed the significance of race and set herself the task of convincing white women to celebrate growing older. So Stanton's central insight was that women themselves needed to be convinced as to the value of old age, to look forward to later life as a time of ongoing development and potential empowerment, rather than just the loss of beauty or reproductive potential. So in this wonderful speech that she gave on the pleasures of age in 1885, Stanton says, I often hear women say after their children are grown up and established in life that they have nothing to live for. I would point them to the broad fields of philanthropic work, to the wants and needs of humanity. Yes, they say, I might have done something 50 years ago, but I am too old to begin now. Not so, 
50, not 15, is the heyday of a woman's life. So Stanton gave this speech on the occasion of her 70th birthday, which suffragists around the country turned into a major event. Women suffragists also staged these large public birthday parties for Susan B. Anthony and here in Boston, or in Boston, Mary Livermore and Julia Ward Hatt. So these events celebrated old women as active and involved political leaders while acknowledging that old age might bring physical and mental struggles, declining mobility, failing eyesight, aches and pains. These women acknowledge that growing older can be very tough. Um, but these celebrations emphasize political wisdom and strategic skill gained over long years of activism. They presented women, in short, as political authorities, as national leaders. And yet, even as suffragists black and white poured all this energy into redefining old age, many Americans continued to use the label old as a stigma to denigrate women. So if you remember that 1850 convention where Mott theorized the term old as a form of ridicule. So as if to prove her point, the New York Herald described that convention as, quote, the incantation of old women, the infidel abolitionists and fugitive slaves, and they later refer to the old grannies, male and female. So this correspondence signaled out both Mott and truth for ridicule. And indeed, anti-abolitionist ridicule tended to mobilize two tropes, what they called racial amalgamation or interracial marriage and the unattractiveness of old women. Both tropes were often combined as in this political cartoon that shows John Quincy Adams introducing the Haitian ambassador to the ladies of Lynn. The old woman in front says, enchanted to make your acquaintance. And she's crowding forward, leaving younger women in the background, if you can see that. So the humor here is that she's acting like a young coquette, but her white hair, lace bonnet, and wrinkles mark her as old and unattractive. And we're supposed to find this humorous. And I want to point out that people at the time would have understood that she's violating both racial and age conventions. Respectable old women were not to behave like this. So, Portraying male politicians as old women was also a staple of political cartooning. People talk a lot about the cross-dressing in 19th century cartoons, but when you look at them, the men who are dressed as women almost always end up looking like old women in 19th century cartoons, which is not necessarily you know, the case for, for gender transgressions. But it's a way, again, of using this trope of the silly old woman to ridicule men in this case. So here, Benjamin Harrison drives Martin Van Buren away from the kitchen with a broom, and this is supposed to represent a political debate, which I won't get into. So 50 years later, in the 1890s, the humor magazine Puck pictured anti-imperialists as busy old women undermining national strength. So you can see that this was an incredibly durable form of political ridicule in the 19th century. But political cartoons were not the only vehicle for poking fun at older women. In um, February uh, 14th, people often sent these very nasty cards that were known as vinegar valentines. They were a kind of practical joke, poking fun at the unattractive uh, this of people who were courting on Valentine days. And the, um, the old maid was a staple of these cartoons. And here you see the old maid combined with the old hen that wants to crow, which is a reference to woman suffragists. So this cartoon is um, t referring to the aged maidens who often try to crow and pretending that all women's rights activists were, were old maids and unattractive. And some of these vinegar valentines were quite vicious. Um, this one's from the late 19th century. It doesn't have an exact date because these were repurposed year after year. But the text says, when you were young, your heart did pant and throb, but a pair of pants never answered to your sob. You were a rose, remember, now I can't, but now you are a faded century plant. And the title says, Gone to Seed. Now, 
You've probably all played the card game Old Maid. It was a very popular game in the 19th century. You'll remember the point is not to get stuck with the Old Maid card. Um, this is a fascinating deck of Old Maid that is um, from the late 1880s. And it shows a, a young looking woman depositing a vote in the ballot box and it calls her an Old Maid. Now, in the 1880s, women had begun to vote in municipal elections. So this is a municipal election in Boston shown in Harper's Weekly in a news photograph where you can see these respectable women voting. The old maid card game almost directly echoes the political cartoon. And you can see by calling her an old maid, drawing in a man behind her laughing, and then encouraging children to play this game, it's teaching a very powerful lesson that even a woman who was dressed in very fancy clothing and respectable could, and relatively young and white and fashionable, um, if she ventured into politics, she risked being called an old maid, this undesirable thing. Children's books also combined the traditional fairy tale representations of witches and stepmothers with political cartoons that showed women suffragists wanting to wear the breeches. So this circulation between um, news photographs, children's books and children's games uh, worked to associate broadly this figure of the old maid or the witch or the old coquette with the political demands of women suffragists. And it worked to suggest that women did not belong in politics. And if they ventured there, they would quickly become old, unattractive, potentially evil. The stereotyping um, for black women was, I would argue, even worse. Uh, so the R.T. Davis Mill Company invented the advertising symbol of Aunt Jemima in the 1890s. I am pleased to say that the Aunt Jemima pancake brand is finally going to get rid of this symbol, though it is actually still with us. Um, it was invented in the 1890s, which is the moment right when African American women had founded the National Association of Colored Women's And Harriet spoke at this meeting. She was celebrated Black women as Aunt Harriet and given a platform to make her argument that white Americans owed elderly freed people material support. Aunt Jemima Flower sold the idea that older black women would happily serve the needs of white families rather than their own, cementing the mammy stereotype as a vicious caricature of the older black woman. So ridiculing older women, black and white, proved um, remarkably tenacious, but it was not the only problem. Most women themselves feared growing older, and advertisers tapped into these fears to sell patent medicines, beauty products, and clothing. So this is an advertising pamphlet from the 1890s. And you can see, look on this picture and on this, how we shall look when we grow older. And of course, it's then suggesting that you buy shaker extract of roots. I think this is a advertising technique, which we would all still be familiar with. But you can see how in the 19th century, it was just so vivid. Look at this, and then this, and this is what you will look like if you don't take care. Um, now, men also face this trouble. So the same pamphlet is showing men as they grow older. But notice that they're choosing male politicians, business leader, men who have status and whose status actually increased as they grew older, even if they feared how they looked. Women, however, had nothing else. And in hyperdramatic terms, uh, this pamphlet tells a story of why she killed herself. And of course, she killed herself because she started to develop wrinkles and lose her beauty and hadn't used shaker extract of roots. So th this advertising technique does distinguish between how men and women grew older. And I think it provides a broad context for understanding the political cartoons that we were just looking at. So age anxiety could hit women remarkably young. So the text for this advertisement for Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound reads, how old I look and not yet 30. So advertisements like this were an invention of the 1880s and the 1890s. We turned to 
technology made full imagery reveal new spins, suffragists themselves are adopting these techniques of modern advertising. Women um, took up color advertisements, um, il newspaper illustrations, in effect, they created their own advertisement for women's suffrage. And in the process, they discovered that images of young, conventionally beautiful white women appealed most to male voters. So by the 1910s, they start to put young white women out front. The parades holding pits, be for men being covered, and circulating on postcards. And this strategy worked incredibly well to convince men they should support women's suffrage. I would argue if they had put these young women out front and adopted modern advertising, who knows how long it would have taken to pass the 19th Amendment. Um, black women also adopted to the strategy, the color magazine supported suffrage. The magazine editor, Pauline Hopkins, was an unmarried woman in her 40s. She wrote many articles about older Black women, including both Harriet Tubman and Sir She wanted to document their achievements as they grew older, but she recognized putting women on the cover was a good marketing strategy, both for the magazine and women's rights. Similarly, Carrie Chapman Cap, president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, was not herself a young woman, but she pushed younger women to the forefront of the visual propaganda and spectacle. Now, you may have heard the last two decades of the women's suffrage movement can be defined by a generational struggle between Alice Paul, who was younger, of the National Women's Party, and Kerry Chapman Cap, who was older, of the National Women's Suffrage Association, and yes, to keep the names straight. <laughs> but historians often present as a generational shift. But when you actually look at what was going on behind the scenes, behind the figureheads out front of these organizations, it was actually a political disagreement about strategy. Alice Paul believed that she should be picketing the White House and courting arrest, and Carrie Chapman Catt wanted to be women forward as the face of women's suffrage. And this was not subtle, okay? So uh, it, it was, Frankly, acknowledged. So um, I love this headline from the New York Herald in 1915, Suffragists Seek Prettiest Women. Uh, striking beauties to appear in new pocket dress parades sought for marshals. Um, other newspapers reveled in trying to judge which woman suffragist was the most beautiful. And they particularly loved covering women who were not only young and beautiful, but also quite wealthy and familiar from the society. Crossover from the society just wealthy women, frankly, not just for their money, which they needed, but also for their looks. So um, this headline is the Beauty Brigade in Canvas for Votes for Women um, in the Uptown section in the the New York Suffrage League. Um, suffrage leaders have obtained the services of a number of beautiful women to make appeals to voters for support on election day. Now remember, those voters are all men that they're appealing to, right? So um, what, what interests me is that women of all ages in the 19 supported visual propaganda spectacles that made young white women the face of women's suffrage. Um, women erased black women of all ages from the visual record and they put forward photographs and drawings and advertisements of very young women. And this propaganda proved for Mark effective um, in winning of male voters. Uh, the 19th Amendment, as you know, was ratified by the states a hundred years ago on August 18th. But I think that this strategy did little to convince Americans that they should vote women into higher office. Um, we all know that we still haven't had a female president and precious few female senators. They much to celebrate the recent victories um, in where more women are getting elected to office. It's really exciting and wonderful. But it's not nearly enough. After a hundred years, we're nowhere near it. 
and we still have never had a woman in the highest office. And I think part of this complex problem, it is complex with many layers, but I think part of it is that as many people have argued, um, these racial divisions continue to divide women and white women's act, women really do refuse to fully commit themselves to anti-racist politics in large numbers. But I think another overlooked dimension of this problem is the continued ambivalence on the part of voters, both male and female, all races and ethnicities, about older women and about growing older ourselves. So yes, Camilla, Camilla Harris um, just nominated by Biden to be his VP. Um, she's 55 years old, um, which is, you know, old in 19th century old maid terms, but nowhere near as old as Biden, right? And uh, nowhere near as old as Hillary Clinton, who ran last. Um, as the first black woman on a major party ticket, she'll be writing a new script for mature women's leadership. I don't know, will she present herself as youthful, which she certainly could, or will she emphasize her maturity and experience, try to do both these things at once? Uh, we'll have to see. But I think how age functions for women are in our democracy is one of the unfinished legacies of the suffrage movement that we had to resolve. And I hope this talk has drawn your attention to why it's something that we should be thinking about. So again, thank you so much, and I would love to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Field. That was that was excellent. Um, and again, if you've got a question down at the down at the bottom, uh, use the chat feature, and uh, we'll read it for you. I I was uh, really struck. Oh, okay, so should I get the chat on? Oh, I'll, I'll I, I can read it for you. It, it, it's fine. Okay. Um, I was struck by the fact you, you ended with the, with that photo of, uh, of Mott and Truth uh, and, and kind of started with it, but you also had one in, in the end, uh, toward the end of uh, that, um, that suffrage parade in 1913. And, and, you, um, and you made the comment, um, it might have been different if younger women had been pushed to the front uh, maybe the record, maybe the time frame uh, would have been different. Um, how, in your view, you know, they 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 clearly used um, these kind of dowdy pictures of of, uh, of older women. Was it the right tactic to take in putting older women dressed in I don't know maybe it's Victorian kind of clothing? But um, was that the right move to make? In the 19th period? Yeah. Uh, so, as I say, what I find um, really just stunning when I started going through these sources, I came to this because I wanted to write on women's rights activists, and there's been so much written, but I felt like there was still more to say. And when I started focusing on age, I realized how much is everywhere and how, starting really with Mary Wollstonecraft in the late 18th century, through the 1890s, Black aid very strong that could not be equal unless we changed how people thought about a woman. So they saw aging, what we might think of as the sort of age dynamics of patriarchy to use actually academic terms as so fundamental to the way power worked that we lived in a system that tended to concentrate political, economic, and cultural power in the hands of old men while excluding old women. And um, it, Mary Wollstonecraft has this wonderful quote, she says in The Vindication of the Right of Women, that part of why women end up subordinated throughout history is the quote, the adoration comes first and the scorn is not anticipated. And so these 19th century women believed they had to convince people that women had to be able to grow old. And in fact, you know, Elizabeth K. Stanton says they need right to grow old. So I don't think it, they even thought about abandoning that struggle. And they lived in a less visual culture than we do today, a culture that was pre-advertising. And I think what happened be, you know, visual advertising. And I think what happens around 1900 is, you know, they 
been fighting since the 30s. Um, the oldest activists are dying off. They are nowhere. And these brilliant strategists see that modernizing is working and sex sells. People are buying new things. And they decide to try this strategy. And they focus single-mindedly on the vote and advertising around the vote and they use young women to do it. And um, you know, this is very simplified, but I think we they they got us victory. Sex can't be used to disenfranchise women, but they abandoned the issues of race that had been so important earlier and they all abandoned these issues of age. And I would say we still haven't fully figured out how to return to an argument that age matters and that we should change how people think about their women. That was going to be my follow-up question. Have, have things changed? If, if so, have they changed for the better or worse? I mean, we're in an interesting moment. I, you know, I, I think um, I've been able to, I've been working on issues of age long enough now that, you know, I have worked seeing someone like Nancy Pelosi or Maxine Waters um, weather a tremendous amount of based prejudice, um, and in Waters' case, combined race. But, um, you know, these women have been billed as crazy old women, ugly old witches, you know, you, you, you name it, you can dig up this stuff on the internet, <laughs> you know, you can go home and Google it. And, they, you know, they've kept going and they've amassed power. And I do think that in the past 10 years, the success of women like Nancy Pelosi and Maxine Waters has begun to change how people think about older women. It is interesting to me that Camilla, Camilla Harris is relatively on the younger side. Um, and I think that makes sense. But I say that partly because I think things haven't changed that much. You know, there were some older women of color that Biden was looking at. And I think partly because of his age, he had to balance the ticket with a younger woman. I mean, one thing I'm completely fascinated by is, you know, I love Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I think she's fantastic. But there's a petition campaign going to amend the Constitution so that she can run for president at under 35. <laughs> and, um, you know, obviously this is done partly in jest, but she has gotten so much press and, and right because she's important to pause and realize if we're thinking of this as a woman that could be our national, right? And why, why do people find her so compelling and will they come? So maybe things change, but not all. Um, how much did these, I'm sorry. Um, how much did these women benefit from World War I and, and pressure on Woodrow Wilson? Um, that, that is a really good question. I think that they, they played the war really well and did so by disagreeing. So I was talking about that split between um, Carrie Chapman Cat and Alice Paul. And part of what they really broke rank over was how to respond to the war. And Cat argued that the stuff had to prove that patriotic citizens serving the nation and therefore deserving of the vote. And Alice Paul said, forget about it. We did that in the Civil War. We did that in the Spanish-American War. <laughs> you know, been there, done that. And they started picketing the White House uh, during wartime. And, you know, they held up signs that said Kaiser Wilson, um, which was part of where uh, they got arrested and had silent targeted at them because this was so profoundly aimed at other Americans that they would um, not only protest the White House during war, but also compare our president to the enemy that we were getting overseas. But what ended up happening through that divisive strategy of the, the different factions going different ways is Wilson and Congress were getting it from both sides. So they had the women that were serving the war effort that they felt that they owed a debt to, and they also had the very noisy women that were pointing out they were hypocrites who were causing a lot of trouble for them, right? And so I think both these strategies helped win women for it and that you needed both ones. It, it was a really hard fight. You know, it was not clear that the amendment passed, um, but the war did make a difference.
for sure. What, um, what surprised you most when researching this topic? What did you find the most eyebrow raising or enjoyable or disappointing? What, what was the biggest thing that surprised you? <laughs> Well, I've spent the past month looking at um, age political cartoons online, and I've remained just aghast at how awful some of these are. <laughs> um, so uh, the just um, theaters of the ageism is constantly shocking to me. But um, I think I am just surprised the, the nuance with which these women thought about age um, particularly in relation to politics and economics. And this just real body of feminist theorizing about what we might think of as old age justice or old age empowerment. And um, it's just gotten remarkably little attention. And I think it's really, really fascinating. I find these women very smart and very insightful and they have dimensions to their thought that people have not even noticed yet. Um. You mentioned about Kamala Harris. Um, theorize if if she were alive today, what would Susan B. Anthony think about Kamala Harris being nom being the nominee for VP? <laughs> okay, so totally uh, speculating. Um, I think that Susan Anthony would be unbelievably angry that we haven't gotten our act together and elected a woman president yet. Um, but beyond that, she would obviously be thrilled. And I think that, um, you know, there's been a big debate about the, the racism of women like Susan B. Anthony. And there is no doubt that Susan B. Anthony let down Black women when she could have allied. With them. She could have spoken out against lyn lynching. Many white women just did. You can't write Susan B. Anthony off as just a product of her times because white leaders of the time had different choices. But Anthony was focused on winning the vote and she thought the way to win the vote was to ally with white supremacists as well. And um, advocates of imperialism at home. So by her death, Anthony is really not championing women of color as leaders who are going to reform the nation. And black women are actually quite rightly disappointed in her. But that said, she was always in a quiet way, and it's not a defense of her, but just a reality, uh, forming alliances with black women in the Black Women's Club movement and working to advance black women's political interests, I think, in a world that had been less racist would have been thrilled to have a black woman may get to the White House as vice president. Um, I, it, it certainly the Susan B. Anthony of the 1860s would have been over. You, you touched on this a little bit, um, but um, who are some of the current women's, at, uh, women's rights activists you admire besides the, the couple you had mentioned before? Are there others that, uh, that you really, really like? Oh, yeah. I mean, what a moment we're living through, right? I mean, I think that the queer Black women who founded the Black Lives Matter movement have managed to transform our nation in a way that is um, play out for years. And I think the way that um, that movement for Black Lives has centered women and queer people of color and worked across generations in ways that are really productive and really fascinating. It's not just a young person's movement, it's a movement like really building intergenerational bridges in communities. And then you see women like Stacey Abrams who are really trying to take on the voter suppression in our country right now and working to build intergenerational and interracial coalitions and doing work um, you know, was just not being done 10 years ago. And I think we are at an incredibly exciting moment. Um, you know, I, of course, remain frustrated. I don't know if you saw um, the public attacks on Kamala Harris, but, you know, quite, quite predictable, you know, and lots of racist stuff. And, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle. I think that the, um, the outright misogyny and rhythm that can be mobilized remains strongly in place, but there are people that are, you know, doing remarkable things to push back against that. 
and I'm thrilled to be alive at this time and watching all this happen. <laughs> well, it kind of segues into the next question that was asked, why is it taking so long for women to be in positions of power and decision-making in this country? Which I know is the $64,000 question, but uh, um, in your opinion, what's... Yeah. What, what, it is indeed. Um, so, you know, my, my little contribution to this debate is to focus on age, and I, I do think it is an important part of it. So if you take something like the gender wage gap, which you've all have, that exists at every age, but it widens after 35. So younger women are able to earn, not exactly, but almost what their um, ethnic, ethnic and racial peers can, can earn. Um, but by the time you reach 35 or 40, you start to see this big opening up. And what's fascinating is it is not just women take more time out for child rearing because it happens to women who never have children. And so what researchers look at age have concluded is that in fact ageism is having this measurable impact on women's handsome, and that women's ability to um, get to the highest level of corporate America politics or cultural institutions um, is still really hampered at part of ageism um, and then I also think Obviously, part of it is the inability of women to work together around race and class, and that we will need to build more robust coalitions across racial and ethnic divides, um, you know, feminists and their allies, if we are going to get real change. And as long as women can still be divided around racial and class interests, we, we really don't have much hope of making progress. Um, so those are things that I would say. And, you know, the Me Too movements pointed out a whole lot of other stuff that's going on. Yeah. Um, what's your next project? What are you working on now? Oh, gee. Um, well, I'm trying to get this done as a book. So I'm <laughs> trying to see the end of that. I am, I'm also uh, co-editing a project that I'm very excited about. It's going to be a volume of... Uh, essays and artist contributions and activist meditations on the global history of black girlhood. And it's bringing together people that are trying to understand um, black girls past uh, around the world. And it may seem odd for someone who's working on old women to be interested in women, <laughs> but I, I'm actually really interested in how age works on both sides of the course. And um, that book is looking at a lot of creative strategies that Black girls and women have used to gain empowerment. Um, well, I want to thank you for taking the time tonight. This has been excellent. Um, thank, you. I wanna, um, um, thank you so very much for joining us. Um, at, at some point, I really hope when this pandemic breaks, you can actually uh, be able to come to Falmouth for real as, as opposed to just doing this. Yeah. So um, uh, thank you for taking the time. Thank you everybody for joining us. Again, we have other programs on women's suffrage. This is just one of a few. So uh, uh, make sure you join us for all of, all of them. We got another program tomorrow night. Uh, thank you everybody. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Field. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see you later. <laughs>